Hey everyone, welcome back to Here in Apologetics. Super pumped to join us today. I have Dr. Jim Sturba today, and we're talking about his paper and some of his work on it. Is a good God logically possible? Um, so, Jim, thank you so much for joining me. How are you today? I'm just fine, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah, I'm super pumped for this conversation. So, before we get into like the big stuff, Jim, do you want to talk a little bit about like who you are and what you do to get started? Okay, so I've been teaching at University of Notre Dame for a long time. Um, but most of my work has been in uh, more on political philosophy. And I did, did that for, for many, many years. Uh, and I still do it. I still teach courses at, at Notre Dame at that, within that area. Um, but then about um, uh, 2014, um, my last, I had published my last book in, in political philosophy from, from rationality to equality. And I was thinking, what am I going to do? You know, you know, we, we always have these projects and I've had many projects and, but I got to this point and I just, I couldn't see any forward. It, it, sometimes with, when you get to my age and you get to that stage, this is the time you say, well, maybe I could retire. This is it. I, I don't have anything more to say. But then it occurred to me that there was something more to do. And, and it, it came out of my situation at, at, at Notre Dame. So, um, so in Notre Dame, I've always been trying to see myself as the, the philosopher. Uh, and then the theologian had another project. And the idea, I kind of got this out of Thomism. So um, uh, religion and, and reason don't conflict. That, uh, in Thomism. In, in, Arist in, in, in an Augustinian view, there are possible conflicts. That's another tradition. But Notre Dame, happily, and much of, uh, much of uh, Catholicism, as I knew it, um, functioned within a Thomistic framework. So that was a nice thing for me because I, I wasn't a theologian, and I, I wanted to be have have a special domain for philosophy. So, so I was the expert on reason in the area of morality and political and political philosophy. Uh, and so that worked for, 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 uh, for many years. And then sometimes I would come up against um, doctrines that of, in the official church, not necessarily the, the laity, but for example, contraception uh, or, or um, homosexuality. And so the, the, the hierarchy is opposed to these things, but and, and that, that, that's, that's where they are. But if you do the argument from reason, it seems to me that those things are fine. So uh, what I would do is I would, in various courses, I would put these arguments out. I mean, there would be a theory and there would be, and then we get to practice and we get to these topics. And I said, well, you know, this is what, what reason alone tells us. Now you, you go to your theologians, go to your theology classes, and, 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 and they should find a way to be compatible with this. That was, that was, that's the Thomistic view. So that worked perfectly for, for many, many years. But then I got to this point, and I'd done many different things. I, you know, affirmative action, environmentalism, feminism, all sorts of uh, peace, peace uh, issues. Uh, what am I going to do? And so then it occurred to me that there was one area that I knew something about, and maybe I could, maybe ethics and political philosophy would be relevant to it. And that was the area of the problem of evil. Because I, you being at Notre Dame, the problem of evil keeps erupting. There's a conference here. There's a conference there. Somebody called in to give a talk. So, I mean, even though you're not working in the area, which I wasn't, I was constantly being exposed to this. There's the problem. And so I see how they're coming at it. And it occurred to me that what, the way they were coming at it is that they, uh, they, they weren't coming at it in the way of a moral political philosopher might. They were coming at it as metaphysicians, as logicians, and most of them working in, a, uh, in, in philosophy of religion in the area were metaphysicians and logicians. Mm. And I'm thinking, well, you know, this looks like a moral problem to me. And and what how what would be the relevance of trying to bring elements from moral and political philosophy to bear? What would happen? And so um, I I said maybe this is something I could do. Uh, I'm an expert in moral and political philosophy, but I've never turned it onto the problem of evil. So I took the idea to the Templeton Foundation, and they said, great, this looks like it's something that should be done. So I was able to invite experts in on the problem of evil and, and also kind of set the agenda a little bit. I wanted to ask them, are there some elements in moral and political philosophy that could be relevant to solving the problem of evil, some, something we hadn't tapped before? And particularly, I had one thing in mind. This is the political philosopher in me. I had the... the that's called in the Catholic circles. It's called the Pauline principle. Never do evil; the good may come of it. It's it's named after St. Paul because there's something like it. In, when I think in 
uh, his epistle to the Romans. Uh, so, so this was a, this is kind of a doctrine. It's 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 not it's not just in Catholic circles. I mean, some of the Kantian ideas are, are just another way of putting the same thing. Uh, but in Catholic circles, it is you know the principle, the Pauline principle, never do evil to come to covenant. Now it looks like there's exceptions to it, okay, but it looks like there's things that maybe not be exceptions to it. So I was thinking, well, how could this come in to play on the problem of evil? I mean, I hadn't seen anything done on it. This is an element of, of political philosophy that might be relevant. There are other things that could be relevant, but this is one thing. Um, so, um, so then I sort of set the agenda and I brought these people in who had been working on the problem of evil. And what was kind of interesting, I, I was waiting to be enlightened. I was actually, I had Marilyn Adams in and, and uh, she's a great expert on, was a great expert on, on medieval philosophy. So I was thinking she's gonna pull something out of Thomas Aquinas and say, here, here, this is it. You didn't see this, this'll, this'll solve the problem. So, but you know, this doesn't happen. And in fact, what happened in, when I brought these speakers in and, and for two conferences, one, one term and one the other, is I sort of, sort of kind of avoiding the issue. You know, not, 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 not a little uneasy with the, the question, are there, are there relevant aspects of one political philosophy that could be useful? Do we have an untapped, I think I used untapped resources. And, and I found them very, un, un, and I particularly didn't like the Pauline principle. They didn't want to talk about how that applied or didn't apply. So then I, <coughs> I got the hunch, maybe I'm on to something. And that's what, uh, after I finished the conferences and put together a collection from the conferences, and actually I did something kind of unusual. Um, you know, the person that edits the collection, they introduce in the beginning, and usually that's it, and then they give the papers and so on. But I actually engaged <laughs> with the, the, the conference people. So I, I didn't engage in the beginning, but I had, um, a conclusion where I kind of engaged them a bit because I had done this in the conference a bit. So what would happen would be um, they would give their papers and I usually have them in advance. And then I would say a little bit, it, you know, well, what about this or what about that? So the idea is I was actually starting a dialogue with them in the conference. And, mm -hmm. and then when they finally wrote their papers, they actually took that into account and did various things. So I was trying, because I was trying to learn. See, here you got to keep in mind, I've been a moral political for a long time, and it took me a long time to kind of learn all the, the, the elements of that. And, and now I was turning to be a, in philosophy religion. And I don't have as much time as I had to become a moral political philosopher to become a philosopher of religion. I had to move this quickly. We got to go quickly. Get, 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 get some results here. So anyway, um, uh, you know, I left the conference, well, the conferences, and, and put the book together, and, and I kept working. And I kept working on it. I started some papers. Um, I then I then got the book manuscript going. And finally, I didn't have where I ended up with in the beginning. I didn't know what I was going to end up with. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. I just wanted to keep pursuing it. And the book is actually shows that kind of progress in a certain way. The real mm -hmm. argument of the book, the final argument, is really finally only stated in the conclusion. It's mm -hmm. it's really maybe in a chapter before that somewhat, but but in the earlier chapters, uh, it wasn't there. And actually, here's a little aspect about this book manuscript. In the book manuscript, there were two other chapters, and those two chapters were quite different. There was a chapter on um, on the, the problem of hell because Marilyn Adams said this was the greatest problem for for Christians. So mm -hmm. you, how do you deal with the problem of hell? And what I think what I did was I gave a theistic solution to the problem of hell. I, 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 and then there was the, there was Darwin's problem, natural evil. I gave a, the, a compatible theistic solution to the problem of Darwin's problem, and then I started turning in the book, and then that's where it built toward atheism. And when I put this manuscript to reviewers, they they were almost all theistic reviewers. They couldn't get their head around it. How could somebody be starting to defend theism and then and then and then critique it? It was just too much for them. So I pulled the two papers out. This, this book manuscript, as it is, retitled, is, is all about moving slowly, maybe, but toward an argument for, for atheism. Um, mm. And I published the papers independently. Um, so, okay, so that's the book. And um, that's how it got there. And, and then I was kind of, well, is it going to work? And so I've been, I've been trying to get, get feedback on it. I've got quite a bit of feedback on it. Um, 
And yeah, so that's been, and, and there are continuing uh, things that are going on that, 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 that'll, that'll, where the argument will be tested further. So um, yeah, I'm, and, and here's the, here's an interesting thing about it. It is a log. it's an argument, I mean, this difference between being a logical argument and an evidential argument is probably kind of crucial because in the history of this, the modern history, it goes back to Mackey and, and Plantinga. My colleague, Plantinga, <laughs> we were really good, good friends. And, and I actually had some interaction with him uh, on, on, on the book project. Um, and so what happened, Mackey had this, has what is called a logical argument. And basically, um, what, and the, the, what's he, here, here's the difference between the logical and evidential argument. Um, the logical argument, it starts with assumption that there's a God, and it starts with assumption there's evil. That's fine. And no, that's common ground. Okay. But then it, what, to be a logical argument, it has to have necessary premises. That's not either morally necessary or logically necessary, metaphysically necessary premises, and then get the conclusion that th there is no God. Uh, now, the problem is Mack tried for that. He had a couple premises put in it. He didn't have it initially there, but eventually he put them there. And Planet came in and basically drove a truck over them. I mean, they didn't work. They weren't even true for humans, let alone being logically necessary. Mm -hmm. and, and at one point, it was so bad that Mackey had to admit he was wrong. And, and, and then at that point, the whole thing ended because nobody thought they were going to come up with some logically necessary, morally, metaphysically necessary premises like Mackey tried for to make the argument work. And so the whole thing shifted to what's called the evidential argument. This is where William Rowe kind of heralded the change. He said, OK, Quantica wins this, but we're going to, you can't do a logical argument but you could do an evidential one. So now it becomes all about probabilities. And that's been the tradition, well, all the way through, as far as I know. Um, uh, I think um, this is the guy out that, um, well, you, you interviewed him um, uh, from from uh, Australia. From Australia, Grimapi? Yeah, he wrote a paper um, uh, where he said, and it was kind of sticky as that. He said he thinks it, people think the logical argument you can't get. He said he doesn't think it, it it's entirely ruled out yet. That was about 2017. Um, mm. 2019, I came up with my book, and actually, Afi, who was open to the possibility of logic, says it's a, it's a great book. And so uh, this, I think, is the first attempt to do what Mackey did tried to do 50 years ago and failed. Hmm. And, and obviously, you know, it's it, it's pretty, well, people would say, well, this has to fail. Nobody, never even, nobody even tried it for 50 years because they saw it was like, like an impossible project. Not impossible, but, but it looked, where, where are you going to get these necessary premises? But that's where my moral political philosophy helped me because yeah, if you're a metaphysician and a logician, you know, what, what, what's my lesser cover? You don't see any. But if you're over in moral and political philosophy, you might find some necessary moral premises there, or you might be able to construct them. You can mm -hmm. Bring over to the problem of evil and, and argue for a solution. That's mm -hmm. basically what I think happened. I wasn't sure I had it for a while, and, and people interacting with me, I, I, I improved at different points. Um, William Hasker was a wonderful interlocutor uh, from the very beginning. Part of the papers into the book manuscript, and then uh, and then a really important book finally came out. Uh, also, it's pretty session of uh, the, the Society for Philosophy of Religion. Hasker was one of the critics. Um, uh, yeah, who uh, um, Pilly was another one, and the editor of the journal of uh, Hall. Ron Hall was the third, um, and so we they they went with their critique of it. I gave my responses, and you know what happened? Hasker wanted another round. <laughs> <laughs> that was called afterthoughts. So then, so then um, uh, they came back with another set of, 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 of critiques, and I came back with another set of. So when the thing was going, it was good. And Hasker, that wasn't the end with Hasker. Hasker and they kept. Um, uh, discussing this because, well, this, another thing that's happened 
the subsequent to the book is there's been this author meet well it's a it's a special issue of the journal of religions and it's on the topic of my book and i was the special i was the editor for a special editor and mm -hmm. i got her in again and so we had another and this time very interesting thing on a certain part of it we was we would always be kind of disagreeing and i finally they kept moving around the, the issue and i said you know it turned out the word consequences i said you must be understanding consequences this way you know but i'm understanding it this way and 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 then once we see those two different understandings the disagreement goes away and there was something else that i did you know, that i finally was able to satisfy hasker by his objection anyway by and i had to you need, that interaction was really crucial to get clear about what exactly, why are we not agreeing? I say this in response to him. He says, this, what, what, what's, Matt, what's missing here? And finally, I figured out, and these, so that was a really important interaction, I thought, with Hasker. Um, uh, and so, so there was there was 16 people that, that contributed essays to this journal of religions in the special issue. I responded to all 16. <laughs> and just, just to let you know, saying the story's not ended. There's now another special issue of, of, of religions, which I'm the guest editor. It's called, the first one was, is a good God logically possible? And I'm like, well, this one is called, do we now have a logical argument against the existence of God? Which is basically asking the same question all over again. But, but and, and this time, it, it's the new date for it is not until September. I have 50 people agreeing to write essays. See, this religion online journal, no limits, no limits. How many people? How long the essays have to be, and or how long the response would be? I'm going to write a book. In mm -hmm. response. It's going to be all in this special issue. Uh, I don't know. If we're going to end up with 50. Probably we'll end up with 40. Um, it's going to be a, a task. <laughs> well, the 16 was a task I never, I've never had before. 40. Now, what's the important of this? Well, maybe somebody's going to come up with. A real good objection, and there have been things that you know that people have raised. Ask for raise certain things. I shifted the argument a little bit. I think I answered it. That was earlier. And then this other thing. I think we he really helped me to see I should make a, another modification to better deal with his, his thing. And um, and there's been a wonderful exchange I had at Princeton with the debate there. Um, and somebody in the audience raised a question. Is actually the fellow who invited me, who is Andrew Shigdell, uh, Princeton. He raised this question, and I answered it. I thought, and then um, we agreed to talk afterwards. We had a, a, a Zoom session later, and he kept pushing this question, and I thought I answered it. And then later, I thought about it. You know, he does have an objection. Yeah, I hadn't thought of this before. Um, and then I said, well, I, I think I can, I finally figured out, initially I thought I was stumped, and then I figured out how But it's very interesting because he was doing something very unique. He, what, mm -hmm. Maybe I'm getting into this a little bit too much, but here's this aspect of it. One of the, in the early days, days with uh, William Hasker, no, with, with, with Bill Rowe, uh, Bill Rowe wasn't even granting initially that there was an afterlife. You know, there was it was it was extended argument, less strict argument. You you try to do probably with no afterlife. Um, but world, and then he thought if you put the afterlife in there, he really is sunk. He, uh, he put it not clear he could do anything left. Um, but but I want the afterlife in there. I truly is another one like this. He does. You, you got to give an argument for an afterlife to get into his discussion. Um, I I no. I want to give the theist. I mean, I, I don't see how the theist has a chance without an afterlife. You need the afterlife to make, make a possible, possible, start the possible case. So the afterlife. But that's where Shagnell's objection was different. What he was drawing on was the incarnation redemption. Mm -hmm. so are you going to give the theist the incarnation redemption? And um, I finally decided I could and still have my problem of evil. And by, by, by logical argument. So that's it's it. This is the kind of back and forth. Um, I don't know, it's 40 people, very good, some very good people in there, and some inter quite inter some international people, more international than the first 16, more, more, more US, uh, uh, UK. Um, but so, 
something could come up. And uh, and here's the other aspect is I, I put this in that um, that, that uh, summary that I used for the author critic critics session. You know, I haven't always been an atheist. <laughs> As I said, I, I became an atheist after I started this Templeton project and got to this argument. Mm -hmm. My atheism depends on this argument. If somebody blows a hole in the argument, it doesn't work anymore. I'm, I'm no more than an atheist. It's all mm -hmm. about the problem. I've, I've been in Catholicism. I was in a religious order for 12 years. So, I mean, I am, I, I'm, I'm kind of content in, in the religious tradition. But I came up with this argument. And I can't see what's wrong with it yet. That's why mm. I have to say. Yeah, that's super helpful. So thanks for kind of laying down that context, Jim. Um, so I'd love to just maybe just dive right into it. Could you just like talk about like what is this argument and how you think it kind of leads towards atheism? Okay. Um, I was trying to think about how best to explain it. I think best to explain it is 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 showing how it goes from Mackey's argument. Mm -hmm. So Mackey's argument's got a first premise: there, there's all good, all powerful God. He's got a premise: there's evil. Um, I just need a premise that, uh, that there's horrendous evil in the world, horrendous e e evil consequence. I want to focus on consequences and not the whole evil act, just the consequences. That, see, that's actually what I want God to prevent. I don't want him to prevent the internal act. I, 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 let freedom reign on the internal act. I'm just worrying, and, and, and I'm only worrying about horrendous evil acts, basically, but the consequences. Mm -hmm. So, so, uh, so, uh, so th th that there that there is horrendous evil consequences in the world, and if there was a God, it has to be through his permission. So that's the, that's the, the other the premise about, about moral, moral evil. And then the question is, um, where's my necessary premises? I told you, really important, and they're necessary moral premises. So what I've done is, the Pauline principle has exceptions, true enough, but I, what I've done is kind of carved out from it three exceptionless moral requirements. And these are my necessary moral premises. And then I claim that given these moral requirements applied to the uh, evils and goods of the world, God is not is is should not should not have been permitting all this evil. And the fact mm -hmm. that he that this evil is there, the consequences are there, is makes it logically impalpable that there's a God there. Who's the god of truth? So he is. It could be some other kind of god. Zeus could Zeus could be there. I can't rule out Zeus. You know, any limited god, I can't rule that. I'm not. This is not not there. It's about the god of traditional theism, which is the all good, all powerful god. Now that's that's one way that you get the argument. It, and and what are these requirements? Well, um, uh, let let me give you the let's see the the third one, which is most. Uh, Obvious. It says, look, um, do not permit horrendous evil consequences to achieve some good when there is um, multiple ways of getting the good without permitting the consequences. Hmm. It looks like that's, it's a no brainer, really, in morality. I mean, you, you're going to, why would you go through permitting horrendous evil consequences to get a good? when you could get that good without the evil consequences. I mean, it, morality is that, yes, don't get it the other way. Don't get it this way. That was, that's one. Um, the other two are, uh, well, the other, the first one is something like um, uh, uh, prevent horrendous evil consequences when um, uh, you can easily do so. Mm -hmm. and, and you're not, you know, I think maybe they say, I mean, you haven't violated anyone's rights and you could easily do so. Now, again, it looks like a, somewhat a no brainer. I mean, think of us, you know, in a situation where here's people, some people's lives you could save and there's some people's lives you could save. Now, sometimes we're in, a, we're in a situation where we can only save because of distance and cause, causal save. We can only save some people, this life or the, these lives. So those five people here, two people, well, we'll probably save the five and we can't save the two because of the causal situation. But think hmm. of God. God calls all situation, no problem. He could save both both groups of lives. So, um, and then the third, second one is says something. Don't don't prevent a, a, a permit horrendous evil consequences to achieve some good 
when the beneficiaries of the good would morally prefer that you had not per permitted the horrendous evil to achieve uh, to provide them with the good. They don't want the good, and they have good mm. reasons to be against it. And they even and, and and also good reasons why you shouldn't even be preventing it. So so that's basically the three principles. And now you you your questions turned a lot about the the the, the goods here. Why I'm mentioning mm -hmm. I, I start off I think some in the paper I do start off with you know goods can be divided up into uh, goods you have a right to and goods you don't have a right to, and then and then those further divide into goods that are uh, logically dependent. On God's permission to prevent us evil, or not logically dependent, and you get four categories. Now, why do I put the four categories there? Because I'm worrying about the skeptical theist kind of argument, which mm -hmm. is saying goods you don't know about, sir, but you know anybody, yeah. And and it's those goods that are justifying God in permitting this evil. See, well, when I'm saying, wait a minute, all the goods that God could give us were anyway. This good had to be goods for us, or goods for creatures anyway. All those goods will be one of these four different types. And then what I will do is apply my, my, my um, what I call moral uh, evil prevention requirement to each of the types and show that God cannot permit horrendous evil to achieve that good. Mm -hmm. So there's a sense then which I've answered the skeptical theist along with is part of the argument, which is something you have to do. Mm. Yeah, that's really helpful. So what I'd like to do now, Jim, if that works for you, is look at some of the objections maybe to your argument, potentially. Um, so there's a few different lines of argument maybe someone want to go around just like trying to present objections. And one is more like a basic idea of like what evils allow for greater goods. Um, so obviously, like I'm, I'm giving a very broad stroke to this kind of like um, idea because there's different things like soul building or maybe preserving free will or things like how would you respond to someone that says, well, like maybe God allows evils and these evils you're talking about in your argument for greater goods, Jim? Well, yeah. Remember, um, the goods are going to have to fall into one of those four categories. So, um, so that the, so all of them will be covered somewhere. So we're not going to be some unknown good. But, but you know, um, um, let's explain why. Um, there, what, a crucial part of my argument here is is that one of the goods that's usually put out there as the good that justifies God's permission of evil is that that's the way you're going to get to friendship with God. That's how you're going to get to God. Mm. Okay. And God is this your relationship with God. That's it. That's the big good, you know? Mm -hmm. And and so what I point out there is, wait a minute, this is friendship with God. And, and everyone, because it has to be voluntary. Um, but it also has to be that God is free to offer it. Mm. And, and it can't be, that he can only offer it, he's, his power to offer it is that he has to, it has, somebody has to commit some horrendous evil and, and then he has to permit it before he could offer friendship. Mm. That would make him, that would limit his power. If God could only offer his friendship to us, um, if he permits horrendous evil, then he's limited. And mm. I claim he can't be limited that way. So yes. that this great good, which is often put out there, is the thing that God is 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 justified in, in permitting evil because it relates to this good. It does, they can't relate to the good logically. They cannot because if they did logically relate, that would be a limitation on God. God must be free to offer His friendship to us. Now there could be some kind of there is moral constraints on God's offering friendship. I mean, He can't offer His friendship to a a child molester. While, the, while he's continuing be, to be a child molester. I mean, mm -hmm. this is not, 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 you know, morally, you can't do that. We can't offer, look, I'll be your friend, you know, but no, no, you reform yourself first, so we'll talk about friendship later. You know, so there's moral constraints on God, but but it, it can't be that he, his power is constrained by he has to permit horrendous evil before he can offer friendship. That would not be a moral constraint. That would be a power constraint. And that is something that, that the all-powerful God of traditional theism couldn't have. So, I mean, that kind of eliminates the big category of one big category. Now, there are other mm -hmm. things. I mean, you did the soul, make, the soul making thing, and that is part of the issue here. So um, think about that. Just think about a case of that. This is where it falls under principle two, or my moral requirement two. Uh, someone has been uh, horrendously assaulted. Here, beat up, 
torture and whatever else. And now, you know, you or I are on the scene and we're trying to console a person, right? help the person. That's soul making. You know, we, we have an opportunity for soul making. And if we and we and we should, you know, take advantage of it if, if this if we come upon the situation. Um, on the other hand, we would, I think, prefer that the person had not been assaulted and and that we and 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 that assaulted had been prevented at least. And then we wouldn't have this opportunity. Because what? Here's my idea. We don't need this opportunity. It's soul making, yeah, but there's lots of other kinds of soul making that don't depend on horrendous evil. Um, and the other thing is, we know that we could be, we could have an opportunity to be friends with God, which wouldn't depend on horrendous evil. And then there's another thing I think we have an opportunity for, is for a decent life. It can't be that our right to a decent life or our possibly getting a decent life. The only way that could could come about is that if God prevented permitted horrendous evil. I mean, people's having a decent life. I mean, unless we all run out of resources, blow up the global oversight, then, then of course nobody gets a decent life. But but as long as there's resources around or God could create extra resources to give everybody a decent life, then it, that can't be conditional on permitting horrendous evil. So we have the opportunity to be friends with God and a decent life. Now you offer, well, here, do you want this soul-making opportunity of cult consoling the the, the person seriously solved it. And I say, no, I'd rather the evil had been prevented. Uh, and it, it would have been soul making for me, but much better not to have that, that evil there and that I, than that I have the good that logically does depend on it. Mm-hmm. You know, you can't have the, the opportunity for soul making unless the horrendous evil happens. But the, the good person says, I, I don't want that opportunity. Now that's the, what's one of those that's logically connected. Um, any goods that are not logically connected, well then provide them without permitting horrendous evil. Mm. And in a way, that pretty much ends it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you've taught that in a way sense that deals with all goods. Mm. Yeah, that's helpful. So thanks, Jim. So I think one kind of like maybe like follow up that kind of follows this flow is like. The question of like, is it possible to have like minor evils but no horrendous evils? Um, so like, say that like there were like minor evils, maybe there are some redemptive good that could come out of them, like human freedom or soul willing or something like that. Um, and obviously, your argument focuses on like horrendous evils. So like, there's this worry of like, was it possible to have um, potentially like minor evils that allow for goods, but then also just like for there to be impossible to be like no horrendous evils? Like, is it possible for there to be a world like that? So how would you respond yeah, to this kind of worry? I just have a thought about this, a new thought. You know, mm-hmm. not, new thoughts come every once in a while, but not too often. This was an yeah. interesting thought and directly related to this. <clears throat> and here's the way I would put it. God is required to create opportunities for us um, where uh, there will be these minor things because we have to grow. We have to, in order to be friends with him, we have to grow in morality. We have to be morally developed and we have mm-hmm. to have opportunities for that. Yeah. And, and, and so we need these soul making opportunities that are that are made possible by by minor evils going on non non horrendous and and they're just fine because that's the nature i mean i see i have this idea that even in an afterlife that was this paper about what what the hell what hell what, what the afterlife would look like even in the afterlife there would be moral morally evil actions uh they just would be no horrendous consequences they would be prevented i mean i was kind of doing in the afterlife what i want want god to do in this life so so i mean it's the same it would, and i and I, I think you know people who read that other paper they did know that in the background was this argument uh for problem of evil argument that was going to make god impossible it was just this was looked like a solution for the t- this could endorse but the other half of the solution is you you th- there should be a different activity for god in the real world so but anyway but no, I think, and I think there always will be conflicts between individuals. I mean, look, look, imagine yourself in the afterlife. You know, you want to be friends with somebody and somebody else wants to be. I mean, you can't be friends with everybody. I mean, you don't have it. Well, even the after, the eternal, well, you know, come back in a hundred years. Um, you know, <laughs> but there's, there's going to be conflicts of some sort. And that's okay. 
I think that's what human life is about. That's why I don't see how we ever get away with um, there's going to have to be freedom everywhere if we ever if we have an afterlife. We did, and it would have to be that, um, uh, and and there would be minor evils if there were a God overseeing the whole thing, and that would just be the way human life goes on. Freedom always, but the, this whole idea. Well, there's in the afterlife, nobody ever does anything wrong. But they're not free. Well, unless they are free, but they never do anything wrong. Um, but you know that can make us. You can make a story about that for God. Hmm. You can't quite make the same story for us that you, you're, you're going to be free and you, and you never do anything wrong. Um, uh, yeah. Anyway. So no, I want. I want. There's a necessity for for minor evils in the world, for soul making, and and he's in for relating with God. If it were God, you you would need this soul making to get prepared up for friendship. Hmm. Yeah, that's super helpful. So thanks, Jim. Um, so I appreciate your charity, like in conversation. And this is super important, like to me, like Christians and atheists, to so, like just being charitable to the other side, and not like being like no one on the other side has a good point. Um, so I appreciate your charity here. So we've talked a little bit about like the eschaton here. Um, yeah. So like, looking at the question of like horrendous evils, so do you think it'd be possible that like even in the eschaton, like could horrendous evils be redeemed, like for some greater good? Like say like um, we're talking about some horrendous evil, like. Um, someone like starving to death and it's horrific. Um, maybe with enough time that evil could be redeemed for some sort of like greater good and the eschaton. Uh, so I'm just curious, like what you kind of think about this kind of objection, Jim? Well, there, there's there are things to start with. I mean, you know, if you're talking about a horrendous evil um, uh, and, and and you want, you know, and basically one way to think about it is it radically restricted a person's freedom, you know, you know, just mm -hmm. tore freedoms out of life and just somebody else exercised their freedom and, you know, extremely. And then the person just lost a whole set of freedom, freedoms of, of, of living their life in a, in a, in a, without assault. There's no way mm -hmm. you can give the person back those freedoms. God can't even do it. You can't. What are you going to do? Recreate the situation? Start them all over again? You, 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 there's so there's there's freedoms lost there. There, you can never, nobody can give them back. Now, the question is, could they give something else to make up for the loss of these freedoms? Mm. Okay, well, you know, I, I did the issue about the, 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 the friendship with God. Well, the problem why that can't be making up for. Not preventing the, these 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 terrific assaults when they occur, and 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 letting somebody being denied very fundamental freedoms. If you say, well, you get friendship with God, but on my story, they could get friendship with God without these, mm -hmm. and with these assaults, or without these loss of freedoms. So it can't be a justification. It can't be appropriate compensation. Something you could get anyway can't be a compensation, appropriate compensation for something that's been taken away from you. So yeah. It, so yeah, that's one that, that's one kind of of, of thing that it, you, you wouldn't work as a, as a making up for it in the afterlife. The other thing is um, the, that these 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 um, uh, evils that well any 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 good that's logically entailed by these presents these evils. They usually are goods in this life, like soul making or or um, I guess that's the well the, the, be the soul making of the uh, of the, the person that could deal with the person who's hurt, or even the soul making or trying person trying to put their life back together. Um, um, those goods, whether you imagine them happening, well, you know, the person's been something terrible has happened in this life, and we what do soul making or fix them, try to fix them up in the afterlife, try to bring them back again. The wish there is. That this evil had not happened, and rather than that, I get the let the evil happen and I get the good. People don't want that kind of good, the reparation good. They want the evil not to happen, uh, and so I don't see anything left out there. I mean, first there's the problem you can't take give these evils, these freedoms back. There's just no way. Then there is the great goods out there. Don't depend on the evils. And then there's the 
goods in the pot here or in the afterlife that do depend on the evils and the beneficiaries of them say, I'd rather not have them. So yeah. there's, I don't see any good that's going to do the justification. Mm. Yeah. Well, thanks, Jim. I have one more kind of like objection that I'd love to talk about here with you. And I appreciate your, everything you're saying here. And this is the idea of like the question of like how much logical arguments can do. Um, so people like Graham Oppie that we talked about earlier will say um, things that like all arguments for and against the existence of God ultimately fail. Um, he said something like that. Obviously, he endorses your well, – not endorses your argument. But he finds it like a, a, a revival of the logical problem. So not like that they all like just suck. But it's just like it's like it's very unlikely that a theist is going to look at an atheist argument and say like, well, okay, when I'm an atheist and vice versa, like it's very unlikely an atheist is going to look at a theistic argument and become a theist. So we're looking at like the nature of logical arguments. Um, they're all going to fall short because – there's just a bunch of other data we need to consider. Um, like one argument isn't enough to go one way or another. So I can hash it out for more if you're a little unconfused what I'm saying, Jim, but I'm just kind of looking at the question of like um, logical yeah. arguments. Well, I'm not sure about this more data. I mean, you know, in, in the Mackey case, mm -hmm. after Parliga raised his objection, Mackey looked at it and said, you're right. I yeah. Mean, it, it's pretty cl clear to see whether you've got, I mean, um, what what would have to happen is somebody would have to counterexample one of my moral principles. And you know, there's an interesting. I don't know if I told you about this. What's interesting going on right now is uh, I'm writing a book, a debate book, uh, with uh, Richard Swinburne uh, mm -hmm. under contract with Oxford, and yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're kind of we're ways along on this. So I gave him my essay, first essay, the way it's structured. I wrote it first essay. He gets to write a second essay. I get a responding essay, and then he gets a final word. He gets the final word of this. That's the way it's structured. But, but um, uh, was that, how was I going to bring this in? So, um, so um, oh, so, uh, so, uh, so let's see. So this is the Swinburne. Uh, this uh, uh, this is so. And here, here's the issue. Oh, yeah, this is the issue. So one of the things I'm looking at is his second essay, or first essay, which is responding to my first essay. And and he rightly goes after my three moral requirements. And he mm -hmm. tries to counter example. Yeah. Now, if he did that successfully, boom, I'm dead. Even one of them, bang, I'm out. Arguments fail. Um, but I looked at them. Yes, I haven't talked to you. We haven't agreed together. I'm still working. We have probably another month on this before I get to say. I don't think they work. But that was mm -hmm. crucial. A counterexample to the, what you need to do is to show here's a here's a good uh, according to your principles, it should be impermissible, but it's permissible. Um, that would that would do it. That's basically mm -hmm. the form of of um, uh, 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 Swinburne's counterexamples, but they don't work for reasons he didn't quite see. I think I can make clear. So, um, so you know, so logical arguments when they fail, they poof, they they're knock out. I mean, because they, that means a bunch of evidence. You know, I survey people. I I, I will go through history. It, it, it's 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 is this a necessary principle or not? Can you counterexample? And um, so I don't know what you, what you exactly mean uh, about, I mean, see, the problem was that before people were looking in the wrong direction. See, I just been, I've been fortunate to be a moral political philosopher here at Notre Dame with the problem of evil all around me being discussed. Uh, and if I hadn't been a moral political philosopher, the idea of coming up with these particular principles I have, requirements, would have never occurred to me. Mm -hmm. If I was, I could have been, you know, if I was there, I was there uh, when, when um, uh, uh, Bill Rowe would said, look, we got to go on and do this. If, if, if we have to do a probabilistic arguments. I would, okay, let me see if I can do a probabilistic argument. I, I would I had no idea that, that that would, that was where everybody went. But I was out of the game for 50 years. And I was thinking about more on political philosophy. And then I come back in with resources that um, people who were working on this problem never thought there existed, those resources. Mm -hmm. And so um, if, it's, if it fails, it should fail quickly and definitively the way Mackey failed. 
That's, I mean, logical arguments really, I mean, you, when you do this probabilistic stuff, you go, well, is it really probable? How probable is it? Of 50% probable, 51%? I mean, you know, you, you, you can't settle anything much that way. Mm -hmm. uh, but see, here's, here's the, here was it interesting. If you go to these, you probably watch these, you know, the, there was a heyday in defense of God and opposition with God, with the, with the new atheists and, and things around them. So you had all these, um, um, I, I saw it, I never saw them in person, but I saw them in videos. So uh, particularly William Lane Craig was fascinating. He was really the best. He, 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 and what did he do? Get that atheist or Peter Singer or somebody out there, atheist. And he said, he'd say, can you show that God, is, the good God of theism is logically impossible? Peter Singer says, no, 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 I don't have a, I don't have a logical, and that, that was it, you lost, you're done, you're cooked. Um, and they all had to do that. And you know, all the new atheists, they, you know, they were doing all their stuff about all the evils and the Old Testament, whatever, but they couldn't, they had no argument, they didn't think they could give an argument that God was logically impossible given all the evil in the world. Mm -hmm. And, and so, in some ways, the theists kept pumping that. Say, well, that's you know, that's that's where we are. You know, you know, and, and they would say they they had probable some probabilistic arguments too. But the fact that the other side had no logical argument just seemed to push them off the table. Mm. But yeah. this is argument, and it it should if it's wrong, it should be easy, relatively easy to push it off the table. The mm -hmm. way math got pushed off. Um. And I, I don't see it yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I think obviously like all, everyone's going to view an argument a little bit differently. We all come at it with different like presuppositions and biases and um, different like opinions and the weight of certain things. So like, we're not going to look at the same arguments and come to conclusion, like the same conclusion. Obviously like, you know, like there's theists, like people like Craig who would have like maybe like a fine tuning or more argument where they're like totally sold and like, this is it. God exists. Um, well, and wait, I'm not. Wait, the fine tuning is not going to help us here. Exactly. No, you're right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you could have the fine tuning, but if if you can't show that the fine tuner is all good, mm -hmm. then you don't have you don't have the God. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're. I think yeah. you're right. And at least for me, this is why. I, like on the theist and the atheistic side, like I always am, like wondering about like logical arguments because mm -hmm. it seems like to me there's always some sort of like counter explanation that can be given to explain the phenomena, and even if like. Um, someone may not think it's a good one. There's always that explanation that's possible. So that's kind of my personal worry. And it's not, it's, it's on both sides, really. Let me see, put, put something else here, though, too. It's kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. you know, philosophers don't agree on very much. And you're kind of saying that a little bit. So, but it turns out that after uh, Planiga gave his argument against Mackey, philosophers, atheists, theists, all came and agreed. Planiga won, Mackey lost. It's one of the most well, few points that all the philosophers got together. Yes, yes, this is we're together. <laughs> and then but, you ruined everything. What? And then you ruined everything. Well, yeah. Well, maybe <laughs> I don't know. But, but the point is, it, it, kind of interesting because we do have a sense of philosophers not agreeing. But and as somebody pointed this out, this is one of the few areas, particularly with the people on both sides of this issue, mm -hmm. agree that this argument doesn't work. That's very interesting. And and so mm -hmm. uh, now it should be something. I mean, I'm look. I, I, I'm 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 trying to make it accessible. I'm trying to get it out there. I, um, it should be tested, and it has been tested, and it will be tested more. Mm -hmm. But at some point, if it's not defeated, it's not defeated. After a, up and, and I mean, you know. I don't know. What, well, you, you, it could always be somebody who'll come up with something, maybe. Mm -hmm. But um, you know, the flat earthers are out there. You know, every once in a while they go out and do an experiment. They go to try. This will prove that the Earth. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Uh, all I do is put this argument out there and listen to people, and and see what. Um, and if they if I give a response and say, "Well, oh, that's stupid," you know, it's no response. Well, then I'll try to listen. I haven't got that kind of response yet, though. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. you know, you're not understanding me. Um, that I don't think that's happened yet. Yeah, mm. yeah. Well, that's super helpful, Jim. Thank you so much for this conversation. Is there any like last thoughts or things you want to say before we wrap up here? 
Um, hmm. Well, um, hmm. no, I, I guess not. Um, um, I, I do, you know, want to keep the dis discussion going, and I'm trying to figure out more and more ways of, of putting it out there accessibly. I thought, you know, this opportunity gave me some new thoughts about how to do it, and and mm -hmm. uh, um. And I think I'm getting better at that, at least making it accessible. I mean, you could go back on the earlier ones and see how much, how much better this one is. Um, so, um, and maybe if I make it as clear as I can, people will find, well, here's what's wrong with it. Here's what's wrong with it. You know, uh, who was it? Was it uh, did somebody say this? Yeah, I, I don't know who said this, but they said it about John Stuart Mill. Um, they said he writes so clearly he can be found out. <laughs> I like that. I always liked this when I was starting out as a philosopher, and I was kind of partly in the continent. I could have gone into the continental tradition and like kind of analytical philosophy. And the continental, it was never quite clear exactly what were they saying. And actually, I watched discussions back and forth, and and yes, they were kind of answering each other. But not in any clear, precise way. Whereas the analytical philosopher, the analytician, was much more, we, you could kind of understand what each side is saying, and it's not as fuzzy. It's clear. I like that. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm trying to be clear about this and getting clear. Um, and so, you know, maybe someday I'll say, I've been found out. Yeah. Well, Jim, thank you so much for coming on today and sharing your thoughts and really grateful for you and your opinion and all your hard work on this topic. Um, there's a link down below to the paper that kind of gives you a general overview of Jim's argument. So I highly encourage you to check that out. And yeah, Jim, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a blast talking to you and I've really enjoyed this conversation. Very happy to do so. Thank you. And, the, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Super grateful for you and all your support. Uh, as always, if you enjoy our content, consider to like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And if you value your content, you can have a Patreon at patreon.com slash apologetics. Even your support as little as a dollar a month means a lot. But yeah, one last time. Thank you so much, Jim, for coming on. Wish you the best. And thank you everyone yeah. for tuning in. Hope you have a good one. One thing. Are you going to send me a copy of this? Mm -hmm. I will. Okay. Awesome. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.